screen. Okay, so welcome everyone to our September meeting. Our speaker today is Yahal Benzi. He is the USA Student Coordinator of National Moth Week, as well as a third year PhD candidate at Rutgers University and the Rodriguez Sayona Lab. His work focuses on the landscape and domestication effects that plants, specifically cranberries and blueberries, have on the attraction of beneficial insects such as pollinators and natural enemies of pests to various plant volatile organic compounds. Yahel has lived in New Jersey for most of his life, going to Rutgers University for both his undergraduate and graduate degrees in plant science and in entomology. So Yahel, you are good to share your screen. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Screen share. Can everybody see this? Yes. Do you see my mouse out of curiosity? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. So let's start. What is National Moth Week? That's uh, my my talk for today. Um, my name is Yehel. I'm a representative both of National Moth Week and I go to Rutgers. I have a little Rutgers symbol there. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, for New Jersey, which has historically been home to Lenin Lenape tribes, and me as a New Jersey resident, as well as Rutgers University student, which uses New Jersey land, I use the space that was once occupied by others. And so now a little bit about me. It's me in a cranberry bog, as you might have heard in my introduction. I study insects that are related with cranberries. Um, I am currently attending Rutgers for a PhD in entomology. I am the USA student coordinator of National Moth Week. And I have also attended Rutgers University for my undergraduate degrees in plant science and entomology. Um, other than that, I have been raised for most of my life in East Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, at the same time as me being raised in East Brunswick, New Jersey, there is also David Moskowitz, uh, who is an East Brunswickian, who went to Rutgers, got a PhD in entomology also. He works in ecology now. Um, and Liti Haramati, who is on this Zoom call today also. And she also is from East Brunswick and works at the Rutgers uh, Marine and Coastal Science Department. Um, and they are both people from East Brunswick um, who in, came together and created the Friends of East Brunswick Environmental Commission in 2006. Um, this is a nonprofit organization that started with the goal of environmental education and conservation of local things. And so they would start hosting events such as uh, they would have birding events where we would go look at birds. I remember some of these from when I was young. Uh, there were free cycling events for um, to exchange items, you know, without having to throw things out. Uh, they they helped a lot um, renovate the butterfly park, which is in East Brunswick. There's a butterfly park which they helped renovate it. And a big, a big thing that the East Brunswick uh, Environmental Commission did was uh, help with salamander migration crossings of the road. I remember this specifically a lot when I was a child. I would go to these and frog watching and, of course, moth nights, which they would have um, every, like a couple of weeks every year, uh, a couple of weekends, they would host moth nights at certain spots. And as the, East, the Friends of East Brunswick Environmental Commission started growing, they also started uh, getting achievement awards, which they started being recognized uh, throughout the state. Um, and this only made Dave and Liti work harder and they'd start doing more projects and fundraisers for environmental uh, 
conservation and and seminars where they would bring speakers in to speak about all sorts of topics. Um, and then in 2012, Lithi and Dave started National Moth Week, which is now also a non-for-profit organization. Um, here's an example of some of the early National Moth Week flyers that they would uh, send around. Uh, and they planned to change this original, original Moth Weeks that they used to hold from being local events like around East Brunswick to being more statewide. And then, you know, if they can, why not have it across more states, make it national? After all, they call it National Moth Week. Um, so in 2012, oh, but bef and while doing this, um, the New Jersey Senate actually recognized the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission and National Moth Week in 2016 for its work in citizen science and community science and bringing people together to view and appreciate moths. Um, and so in the first year that they ran National Moth Week officially, 2012, they saw registrants from almost every state and across 31 countries, which is very impressive, you know, for a first time event having it in 31 countries, uh, especially when the original plan was to make it national. Uh, and this National Moth Week occurs annually at the, the last full week of July, with this past National Moth Week happening again last full week of July. And it had thousands of registrants across 117 countries. And this this is this is it's it's just grown so much um and you know 170 countries that's more than some of the olympics that's more countries than in some of the olympics have been um here's a nice little map showing registrations from 2012 uh and now in 2023 with the different colors representing um private versus public registrations that they had for their mothing events. And we see like a very big expand in registration across the world, which is super cool, uh, especially coming from my hometown, East Brunswick, you know. Uh, and so some goals for National Moth Week, uh, which the one of the main goals is to celebrate the beauty, life cycle, and habitats of moths of all kinds. Um, another community-based goal is to encourage uh, mothers, or that's what we like to call people who like moths, of all ages to come learn about, observe, and document moths. You know, exposing people from a young age is very important, uh, especially, you know, me as an entomologist, I and I, I work also as a teacher assistant and I experience all sorts of people who really hate insects and and moths are like a lovely introduction which you could really hold uh, get your foot in and learn more about the ecosystem because moths just look so cool and are very important and another goal of the National Moth Week is to map the moth distribution and provide other citizen science-based information using databases that are now with technology advancing. They're now available to a lot of people, such as these online projects, iNaturalist being a big one, where it's just you know an app, you take a picture, you upload it, and it's there. And it says the date, time, it's a really good uh, resource for any potential signs and uh, distribution patterns that you could track. Um, and this is an example from iNaturalist National Moth Week from this past year, 2023, from this one week. We saw uh, one, 157,000 observations of moths across the globe in this one week, uh, with over 8,000 species found and almost 24,000 observers, which isn't quite the amount of uh, registrants we had, but this just goes to show that even people who are not sure about National Moth Week existing still 
have an interest in moths and maybe have heard about it but haven't registered. And it's also been uh, documented in more places than the locations of registrants. And it's 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 a very cool event for me as a scientist, but me also as someone who just likes insects. That so many people are participating in finding and documenting all of these moths. Uh, and so I've said moth so many times now, so I guess I'll define it. What's a moth? Um, and of course, I'm speaking to the New Jersey Butterfly Club here, so um, it's very similar. Uh, both moths and butterflies are in the order Lepidoptera, which are characterized by scales on the wings, as you've seen in this picture. Each little uh, pigment isn't actually its part of the exoskeleton. It is a scale which can and will fall off if you shake them too much. Uh, also, most moths, or lepi most Lepidoptera, that is, have a uh, mouth which is modified into a proboscis, which you see in this picture here with the um, like uh, tube-like tongue here. Um, that's the proboscis. And oftentimes, the wings are joined together by a bristle called a frenulum. And these are just like scientific terms that help define and characterize this order, Lepidoptera. It's a very diverse order. People love butterflies, also moths. Uh, and so a lot of people have gone out of their way to define moths and discover different Lepidoptera. Uh, so it's amongst the most diverse orders that humans have uh, established. And they range in size by a lot. They could go from 2.5 millimeters all the way to 355 millimeters in wingspan that's like the size of like a you're like smaller than a, a pinky to the size of a hand more so um and when you look at specifically moths moths are categorized as any member of the order lepidoptera which is not a butterfly and scientifically and taxonomically these are not Moths is not one group. It's a whole range of group um, with technically butterflies falling under the category of moths. So if you look here at this uh, fun little uh, family tree, you could see everything here that is in orange or green is a moth, while here, this, these blue group here, that's it for butterflies. Moths is everything else, whether it is farther down the tree or higher up the tree with the green ones representing macro moths which are big and the orange ones representing micro moths which are small moths um, and in terms of diversity again lepidoptera is very diverse with over 175,000 species described and they're always describing more as time goes on with better technologies. Uh, in New Jersey alone, there has been over 2,000 described species. Um, and moths are found in most habitats all around the world. And most of them are herbivorous. Not all of them. We got this one fella up here, the vampire moth, which has been known to feed on blood. However, this is not found in New Jersey. But it's... It is a fun, cool exception to the rule, you know? Uh, here's a couple pictures of moths where you could really see how they look different. Their, their patterns are beautiful and their shapes are all different also where you got moths like this Luna moth with the long uh, wing, the hind tails on the wings, you know? Uh, you got this pink and yellow moth. You got moths that look like crane flies, moths that look like bees. It's it's really very, very beautiful order. Uh, and for humans, which is us, one of the most important things about moths is in the interactions between humans and moths is pollination. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of some pollinators. And pollination can be very important uh, because while humans uh rely on pollination not much is known necessarily about moth pollination as compared to you know bee pollination which is the 
the big forte. However, moths are very much well known to pollinate. We got some examples here on the top. You got this uh, yucca moth, which is the only, uh, it's an obligate uh, pollinator. It, the only plant that pollinates is this yucca. And it, you know, if the moth didn't exist, then the plant wouldn't exist anymore. Another example of that is this Darwin's hawk moth and Darwin's orchid, uh, which Darwin, as you can tell, uh, once saw this flower with this giant nectary and hypothesized that there there must be some some animal that can pollinate that can reach all the way down there. And lo and behold, several years later, they discovered this Darwin's hawk moth with a very long proboscis. Um, another very important interaction with humans and moths. Um, Oh, wait, before I get into that interaction, there's a very cool chart that I'd like to explain a little. This is from a study, uh, a recent study, looking at correlations between flowering plants and lepidopter diversity, where it's a little hard to uh, follow, but um, if you could see my mouse, which I hope you can, uh, I'll be pointing. The green here on the left represents the diversity of uh, flowering plants with every little split there being a um, speciation. On the other side, you have the, the gray side, this like gray purplish color. You have the same thing, but with Lepidoptera, with again, every split representing speciation. And you can see um, that there's a lot of uh, similarities between when and where. Uh, speciation occurred. This blue line here in the middle represents um, bats, which bats can be important pollinators, but they can also be important predators of the moths. And you can see where that before the um, credibility of bats existing, there has been like a lot of the speciation both in the flowering plants and the moths evolving Similarly, uh, with this yellow section here is all that that's all uh, that's all butterflies with the rest of this gray Lepidoptera being moths. And now for the other very important human interaction is agricultural pest, which unfortunately, as an insect lover and as someone who loves to appreciate the beauty of moths. I have to admit there are a lot of agricultural uh, pests in from Lepidoptera, such as, you know, if you ever bite into an apple and you see that worm in the apple, that's probably a coddling moth. Uh, you also have these like corn borers and the, um, the Indian meal moths, which are very important uh, pests that people try to control. Um, and it, it's it's important to note that even as someone who loves moths. Uh, and there's other economic products, however, that moths and humans come together. Uh, for instance, silk. Silk is produced by silkworms on the most part, which is a moth, which have now been domesticated to highly produced silk. Uh, important agri uh, economic commodity. Another thing is in certain countries and cultures, moths and caterpillars are eaten as food, which is very cool and uh, maybe not as common in the U.S., but, you know, are a pretty sustainable source of food if done right. Uh, another very uh, important thing is that moths are very inspirational and lead to many sources of art, whether it be like physical art, but there's also plenty of um, uh, like videos and films and characters that are based off moths, which, you know, and mythologies that are based on moths. And humans have been looking at moths for ages. Uh, and then finally, moths can be very useful in science. In fact, the first ever pheromone 
pheromone. Ever found pheromone? For those of you who don't know, is a volatile organic compound. It's it's a chemical that is emitted by one member of a species that affects other members of the species in a normally positive way. Um, and the first ever pheromone found and identified was uh, sex pheromone from female uh, silk moths, which would exude this pheromone and then it would be attractive to the males. And, you know, that's that is like um, opened a whole new branch of science, the science of smells and the science of pheromones and the science of interactions using volatiles, which me, I don't know you heard my introduction that's something i am personally very interested in uh so i included here a little study that i think is super cool looking at um food chain interactions which while this experiment is not like about moths it is using moths which you know that's another very important use is that moths can be very much used in science as model organisms so in this experiment done by Ted Turlings in 1990, he wanted to learn about the interactions between different levels of the food chain where you got a caterpillar. In this case, they used the beet armyworm. And they wanted to see if this caterpillar, it eats the corn, that's known. And you also have this parasitoid wasp that attacks the caterpillar. So they wanted to see what is it, and if there's any interaction between the wasp and the corn skipping over this caterpillar step. So what they did, they took a bunch of corn. One of them they left empty. One of them they put a caterpillar on it to eat. And another one, they simulated the damage that would have been done by caterpillars mechanically. And then they released this wasp. And lo and behold, they found that between these three choices, the wasp was attracted significantly to the corn that was eaten by the caterpillar, which is very interesting because that implies that something about the caterpillar being there is making this plant more attractive, the plant. It's making the plant more attractive to the wasp, uh, that something that, like mechanical damage by itself wouldn't do. So what they did next is they added another one to the study where, of course, they had the one with the blank control, they had the corn with the caterpillar, they had the corn with mechanical damage, and then what they did, they had the corn with mechanical damage, except they took the spit from the caterpillar and drizzled some of that spit on the mechanical damage, and lo and behold, wasp again was attracted to that of the caterpillar. However, it was also attracted to the corn that had mechanical damage and the caterpillar spit. And, you know, this, me being someone who's very interested in the chemical ecology, the interactions using chemistry between the different organisms, I found this super cool. You know, they found that the corn exhibits, it releases different volatile compounds based on whether it was eaten by a caterpillar versus whether it was um just mechanically damaged and there's something in the fact that the caterpillar spit needed to be there for the corn to realize that there is a caterpillar and thus release chemicals that might be attractive to the wasp and you know i this is a very foundational paper in my line of research where i'm looking at beneficial insects and i'm looking at uh volatile organic compounds emitted by plants and I just think this is super cool, so I had to include it. Um, however, that's not too much about National Moth Week. Uh, another very interesting study that has been done about moths, this time about moths, not just using moths, was this study done uh, looking at moth declines. So this uh, Dutch group of scientists wanted to know how have moths been declining. And the only real way of ever measuring decline in populations is to measure populations over time. Um, so what they did with this, they looked at population trends in macro moth species in the Netherlands from 1985 to 2015. 
And now, if not like this person has been studying these moths since 1985, they instead, what they did, they looked through records, journals, data collection websites that had data that was collected by citizens, and they analyzed all of the moth species, uh, a macro moth species that were caught in that uh, 30-year range, and they analyzed the different ecological traits of the different moth species to see if there is a correlation between moth population trends and other sort of ecological traits that might happen. And so two of the very significant traits that they looked at, they looked at nocturnal moths, because again, there are moths that are out during the day. And they also looked at moths that are attracted to light. Now, people still aren't 100% sure why moths are attracted to light, but they did find in this study that moths that are either nocturnal or attracted to light have been declining more than the diurnal, which are the daytime moths or the moths that are not attracted to light, which is a very interesting study. Uh, and it has a lot of basis. A lot of this um, study is due to the fact that there have been records, journals, and data collection by the citizens. And they further found in this study that, you know, maybe artificial light at night is an important factor in moth declines. Uh, and this is a very interesting study using old records throughout history to, to find trends that can be later um, used to look at the future. And so how can National Moth Week help with science? Uh, you know, one of the goals, as I said earlier, of National Moth Week is to document the moths of the world. Um, and clearly, you know, tracking moth diversity and distribution can help us research moth declines. Uh, and a different study, uh, not looking at moths, but looking at termites, have found that citizen science documentation of insects through databases such as iNaturalist, which is one of the main National Moth Week databases, has been shown to complement expert entomological collection in terms of both space and diversity, which, you know, this is, uh, this means the National Moth Week can help a lot with moth uh, studies, not just the clients, but can help with all sorts of different ones. And so how do we document moths? Um, there are several ways to document moths. Um, a very common way is pheromone baits. Pheromone baits are, uh, they utilize these sex pheromones, which I described earlier, such as the sex pheromone of the silk moth, which was first, that's the first pheromone ever discovered. Um, and these pheromones usually can only attract one species because normally pheromones are very species uh, dependent where each species kind of has its own pheromone. Um, and this has proved very useful in science for tracking species distribution, whether they be beneficials and very cool uh, moths or rare moths, um, but it's also been used in pest management uh, because now that you, know, you use a pheromone bait, you know if you're a farmer where your moth uh, pest problem is, you can more sustainably um, control for this pest. However, it's also been used for tracking uh, invasive species and rare species uh, and cool ones. You see, this; these are two different forms of uh, pheromone baits. Uh, another way we could document moths is using uh, sugar baits, which here are some examples of that. And it's usually a combination of fruit sugar and some sort of like fermenting um, alcohol or vinegar. And there's so many recipes online for different uh, for different baits. Uh, David Moskowitz from National Moth Week, who I mentioned earlier, has his own recipe. You can see that in the bottom picture where it looks like he used canned peaches and uh, bananas. But there's all sorts of recipes. And these can be very attractive to moths who then come to drink from them. But then, you know, there's also other insects 
that this can be used to attract, uh, you know, you put that out. I wouldn't be surprised if you get like fruit flies too, you know, with this sugar and fruit and vinegar. Um, and then the last but not least and debatably most used way of documenting moths, especially in National Moth Week, is black lights, which here are some examples of black lights. Uh, as we said earlier, many uh, moths are attracted to light. Uh, and so we could utilize that by going out at night, especially when there's not a lot of light near you, and setting up either lights or black lights. If you don't have black lights, normal lights work. And you just put it out and all sorts of insects will come flying, uh, moths especially. Uh, and, and if you increase the white space using sheets or buckets, it can uh, increase the space at which moths see this uh, black light. And many people also use these uh, black lights in conjunction with the sugar baits, which I said earlier. That way the moths come, they have a little treat. It's good for them. Um, and then the big, the big thing, once the moths come, you see the moths. For us at National Moth Week, we got to take pictures. Some people like collecting and actually preserving the moths. However, you don't need to, to document them. You could just take pictures, upload them into iNaturalist. Many people have uh, smartphones nowadays. And so that definitely makes it easier to put it onto databases, which later can be used um, for science and stuff like that. And so looking at citizen science and community science, these are both words that I have mentioned already today. I just wanted to define them where citizen science is defined as projects that can help scientists, which as seen National Moth Week clearly can help scientists. Uh, however, community, sci community science is defined as projects that help the community. And luckily for us, National Moth Week is great for both. Um, here are a couple pictures from these past uh, National Moth Weeks where we see communities coming together all over the world. We got students, we got children, we got adults um, coming to appreciate the beauty, life cycle, and habitats of moths and learning about moths and getting that great introduction to ecology and entomology and what it means to be to understand nature more. Uh, and that's it, you know, now we have to just remember for, to register for the next National Moth Week and to spread the word of the worlds of moth. And uh, these are the citations of the papers that I uh, used. And that's all I have for today. Thank you, everybody. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take. And Liti is also here. Liti is one of the co-founders of National Moth Week. If you can see her in the video, uh, I'll stop my share. I'm sure uh, she would also love to answer any questions. And I hope I didn't get any of the history wrong, Liti. <laughs> you got it perfectly right. Thank you. Great job. Yes, very good job. Um, so now I just want to offer uh, for our members, anyone that wants to unmute, uh, please feel free to unmute and you can ask questions or anyone who may be a little more shy, uh, you put them in the chat and I can read them out. But this was a great presentation, Yahal. Thank you. Um, so how would someone, if they wanted to get involved here, how would they um, participate? They would take pictures and they can upload them to like the uh, the databases that you referred to, like iNaturalist? Yeah, that's the easiest way to participate in National Moth Week. However, if you are very avid about National Moth Week, uh, we're always looking for volunteers to help spread the word, you know. Um, I don't know if you're from New Jersey, there's plenty of uh, registrations. You can host public events, you could host private events, you could go to public events, all sorts of things. Um, we are also in the midst of doing a big mapping project. You saw some of the maps we were looking at earlier, and we we would like to see all sorts of things. Liti put in the chat also um, information and registration. Uh, we have a website, nationalmothweek.org. Yes, thank you. Um, 
And then if anyone else has anything, or if anyone wants to ask anything, I'll give everyone a minute. Uh, if anyone wants to type anything in the chat, or again, feel free to unmute. Some other things that in National Math Week we're doing, um, I guess I'll say, uh, we are also, I am planning on an event for, during to happen with other professionals, because I am an entomologist and I come from the angle of a scientist. And so I am planning later on, um, in a couple of months, we're having a big Entomology Society of America meeting in which I will be hosting a symposium talking about citizen science and how we as, or I guess me and maybe others, as professional entomologists, how the interactions between professional entomology, citizen science, and also uh, public policy, how all three of those come to play. And I, depending on how that symposium goes, I might uh, write a little paper and publish it somewhere. Uh -huh. So, so be on the lookout for that if you're interested. Um, let me. I am just going to stop recording quick so everyone will hear that. Um, 